Hey, everybody. Today is Monday, May 29th, 2023. Coming up on the show today, from HBO's The Last of Us, editor Timothy Good. I didn't know much about The Last of Us, and I didn't play the game. And I remember something that a producer at Bad Robot told me like a decade ago, and he said, don't know too much, because if you know too much, then you're just going to replicate what's already been done. And editor Emily Mendez. With me, it was a game that I had played that was my favorite game. So I knew all about the game. I had played the game a couple years before, so I, I wasn't playing it fresh, but I was still in love with it where I knew the characters, I knew the story. And so I brought that with me to the show when Tim and I were starting. Yes, all that and more on this edition of The Rough Cut. And so begins another broadcast day here on The Rough Cut. Good to see you. Thanks for coming. On with the show. I have to say, I've had more than a few requests for this one that we're doing today, and I am thrilled to finally be bringing it to you. It, of course, is The Last of Us, the hit HBO series adapted from the hit video game of the same name. And when it comes to The Last of Us, well, our friends at Wikipedia would tell you that the story is set in 2023, 20 years into a pandemic caused by a mass fungal infection. I added the EU, that's not Wikipedia. A mass fungal infection that causes its host to transform into zombie-like creatures, subsequently collapsing society. The series follows Joel, played by Pedro Pascal, who is a smuggler tasked with escorting an immune teenager named Ellie, played by Bella Ramsey, across a post-apocalyptic United States. Neil Druckmann was the creative force behind the video game, and one of the game's legion of fans was writer-director Craig Mazin. You might know him from Chernobyl, the TV series, not the actual nuclear disaster. Mazin joined up with Druckmann to pitch the series to HBO, and HBO said, hey, sounds good to us. And the rest is history. Two key contributors to that history happen to be our guests on the podcast today. Editor Timothy Good and assistant editor and also editor Emily Mendez. They make a great team, and I think you'll hear that in our discussion with them. You'll hear a lot of things in our discussion with them. But before we get to those lots of things, here's a few quick things about how you can make audio magic in your next film or TV series, mass fungal infection or not. So I ask you, how important is music to a great show or movie? Well, you know the answer to that. It's everything. And the place you got to go when you need a song or two for your next creative endeavor is Extreme Music. Their vast catalog of production audio features music from everyone from Trent Reznor to Tom Holkenborg, a.k.a. Junkie XL. No matter the names they go by, these artists are the best of the best. Now, how do you find their awesome tracks? Well, you just do a quick and easy keyword search on things like instruments, genre, speed, vocals, era, mood, composer, any little details you have in mind for your story. They give you back amazing tracks and various links with whatever instrumentation you need. On top of that, you can even search for music that sounds like a reference track you give to them. All of that power in one simple-to-use website where you can do all the licensing online or get a little help from one of their reps at an office nearest to you. So the next time you need the best production audio out there, check out ExtremeMusic.com. All right then, time for a little post-apocalyptic post-production. From The Last of Us, here are Timothy Good and Emily Mendez. No, I got nothing. That's never been an issue. Oh no. It actually works the other way anyway. I'm supposed to be talking to you. I'm excited. You would think that we're here to talk about The Last of Us, but technically that's not true. Um, we're here to learn about Tim and Emily. The Last of Us is just a great excuse to do that. That being said, I thought we should start by talking about another TV show called The Resident, because that seems to be where your journey together begins. I don't know. We'll see. So tell me about that show and how it brought you two together. Aha, The Resident. Um, well, it was amazing to meet Emily on The Resident. And weirdly enough, she was not my assistant editor at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I started in 2017 with a, an assistant editor named Amanda Pinella. And Emily was working with another editor named Nicole Vaskell. And what was fun was that we all got along. And that was the cool part is that everyone was like really friendly. And we were like, oh, wow, we, we sort of love each other. And then after the first season of The Resident, um, I got an opportunity in the off season to do season one of The Umbrella Academy. And I was like, let's do it. So we did. And the way it worked is I have been a big advocate of mentorship my entire career. I was mentored by Norman Buckley, ACE, and he has been an incredible influence on uh, on my life and career. And so I, it's been a part of my journey this entire time to do that. And so in season one of Umbrella Academy, I had a situation where I had to come back to resident season two because they were actually going to give me a directing position, which I was like, that is incredible. Uh, so everyone understood that I had to do that. And so I uh, asked them if they would allow Amanda to have a co-credit with me at the end so that she could finish the last episode before I had to go back. And they said, yes, of course, let's do that. 
um, because she was great and I'd been training her for a while and they really loved what she was doing. And so she finished uh, the season one episode for me while I had to go back to season two. Then when season two of the Umbrella Academy comes around, they say, can you come back? And at the time I couldn't because the resident now is asking me to direct yet again. And they said, well, what do we do? I said, well, you now have Amanda and you know how good she is. And so they hired her as the editor in my stead. So now I was lacking an assistant editor at that point. And now if Emily wants to continue the story, I think that you have uh, more of an insight on this next section. Well, at the same time this was all going on, my editor, Nicole, was moving to a different show. And I had really grown very close to a lot of people on The Resident, and I wasn't quite ready to leave yet. And also, Tim had still, like, he he's really great about calling people into his room. He'll be like, you want to come see the scene? You want to come, you know, check it out? And, like, so he was already kind of mentoring before I was even assisting for him. So I knew he would be a great fit when he called me and was like, hey, I'm looking for an assistant. And I was already kind of wanting to stay on the show just because I loved the people. It was close to where I lived. And it just worked out that way where I was like, yeah, I would I would love to join as your assistant because uh, I need an editor to work with now. So it, it really worked out that way. Yeah. And Nicole gave us her blessing 100 percent, which was what was great. Totally. I mean, we were just like, thank you, Nicole. <laughs> yeah, we love Nicole. And she was like, yeah, no problem. Yeah. You know, have a great time. And so that began our sort of uh, working relationship. Mm-hmm. And uh, and and then uh, I believe it was season it was three, right? We started fully working together season three. Right. And the very first thing I did was co-credit, right? It was up front. Yeah. 302 right away. Yep. Because I was like in Europe and I couldn't get back. And so I'm like, please, can you allow her to co-credit with me? Because she had worked, you you co-credited on uh, with Nicole, correct? Yes. A couple episodes with Nicole during season two. So yeah. we knew that it was going to work out pretty well. Exactly. And everyone um, on The Resident was, it was an incredible place to work. Everyone is super supportive. And the showrunner, Amy Holden Jones, she was an editor and she learned from Hal Ashby. So she had incredible information, instincts, experience, and she would share that with us. Uh, and it was just a wonderful sort of place to to learn and to experience all different types of uh, structural storytelling. Yeah. Well, I don't want to take too much of a tangent, but that's such an interesting data point that she was an editor as well. When you're in an environment like that as the editor, what sort of benefits does that afford you when the showrunner, the director really can understand what you're going through just a little bit better? Ooh, good question. It's faster. I'll tell you that much. It's very, it's much faster. And Amy was extremely quick because she knew exactly how to make things work. And so she'd say, okay, so let's go from here to there. And from this line to that line, I remember it was like, if you couldn't keep up with her, it was like, woo, I was, I was always running around uh, trying to, to, to stay up, uh, stay afloat with her because she was just always two steps ahead of you. And so I would sort of uh, rough things in quickly and I would just go back to them later and, and sort of dial them in. But it was really quick. It was always really wonderfully collaborative because I'd say, well, what if I did this? Oh yeah, I see what you're saying. So there was this, uh, there was this familiarity with the language of editing, which really helped um, so that we had these ridiculous schedules where we were doing like 23 episodes, which now seems like, you know, a, a, a four, like a, a huge amount of episodes based on most seasons. Um, and we were, we never got behind. We never had a, a problem because of that. And so I feel like that sort of uh, actually helped overall the show was able to stay. Uh, they never felt like they were uh, falling behind. They, they didn't have to divide their attention. No one ever had to stay overnight. There was never any like extra excess work. If we could just still stay on this tangent really quick, I promise we've got a lot to talk about with The Last of Us. But Emily, you seem to have successfully navigated something that editors starting out, something everyone's trying to figure out is how do I build those connections? How do I make that jump? First, it's how do I get to be an assistant? But then it's how do I make that move up to editing? And not everybody has a Tim who's so forward thinking and like, how do I help bring up this next generation? Are there things that you try and do to really make those connections with editors or to find those spots where you can move up? Yeah, the first thing that I think is a great skill to have is sound design. I think that's something that a lot of editors rely on their assistants for because they just don't have the time to do it. And so, and it's also a creative thing. So it's a way to get in there creatively um, when otherwise our jobs tend to be a little more technical. Uh, but yeah, I think sound design is a good way to show your creativity, show what you're able to do. And that has helped me a lot. Uh, my other editor that I'd been with before, Nicole, was also really big about moving her assistants up. So that's also why I was able to co-edit with her. So I think it's good to get with people that you feel want you to move up. And 
I was sticking with these editors because I knew that they had that viewpoint of like, I want my assistants to move up. And I think sometimes as assistants, if you know your editor doesn't feel that way and you do want to move up, then sometimes it's best to kind of be like real with yourself and be like, this is not going to happen. I need to get with someone who's going to help push me up. But I think a good skill to start with is sound. You get your creativity in there and you can show your storytelling skills through sound. And that's something I'm always, that's my approach for sound always is like, how can I help the story? So that's a great way to start. Absolutely. Well, I think, Tim, this is your first time actually working with Craig Mazin, but I believe you've known each other for a while. So how did that relationship begin and how did it evolve into you getting the gig for The Last of Us? Yeah, no, it's uh, I've known him for a long time as a uh, uh, my husband's f- friend. Uh, my husband is a screenwriter and they are friendly together. They have been friends for a while. And so he and his wife and some other writers would show up at our house here and there and we would have silly dinner parties. Um, one of them involved 70s foods that everyone dared each other to eat. And I ate Craig's celebration salad, which was uh, basically vegetables inside a jello mold. And he was like, kind of horrified that I liked it. Um, and so he was like, you're interesting. And I'm like, maybe. Um, but I was kind of like, just like the, I was like the side guy there. I was like, not part of the team. I was like helping. I was like giving, serving drinks, you know, making sure the dinners were good. And then, you know, one time he says to everyone, I've done this show called Chernobyl and I'd love to show you this trailer for it. And I was like, yeah. So I, you know, cast it on to my Apple TV and we watched it and everyone's jaw just dropped. We were just like, this is unbelievable. This is incredible. Um, and I remember like shortly after that, I just said, I, 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 I want to work with this guy. I, I, he's smart. He's funny. He's so wise. He seems like editorially, he, that what he was doing was lining up with what I like. And so I just asked him, I said, if there's anything in the future that you ever do, I, I mean, I know I'm just the husband right now, but I also can edit. Um, and luckily he had seen some of uh, my work on Umbrella Academy because his kids were fans. And a few years later, I followed up with him and followed up with him and the timing wasn't going to be right um, and schedules were off and and what have you. And I was like, oh, this is too bad. And then one of the directors of Umbrella Academy was booked on Last of Us and said, I would love it if you were the editor on Last of Us with me. And so I went to them and I said, oh, you just hired one of my favorite directors and you know, can you, maybe I can get onto it now. And they said, oh, we've already hired everyone. I'm so sorry. The schedule's ah. And I'm like, I know it's okay. So a scheduling issue happened with one of the editors and they said, okay, there is now a spot available. And if you can get to Calgary in a few weeks, you can have, we think you can get that spot. You have to interview, of course, we have to talk to a bunch of people. And I'm like, okay. So I had to do the whole process. I talked to everyone and I was so grateful that they decided to hire me. And Emily, how about you? How did you, obviously you have your connection to Tim, but do you have to interview with other people on the show? What does an assistant editor have to do to get integrated into a new show? I did have to interview um, with our post producer, Greg Spence, before getting hired on the show. But basically Tim brought me on. He was like, I want Emily to be my assistant. And so that goes a long way. And I still did interview with Greg, but basically Tim just brought me on. I basically just explained to people like, you do not want to miss out on this. Is what I always say. I'm like, don't miss out on this one. So it's your, it would be, it'll, it'll be your fault. There are two things that I really found most remarkable about this show's success. The first is that projects adapted from video games don't typically have a high success rate. You don't have to look much further than Uncharted, which was a movie made from a game uh, made by a lot of the same crew, core crew from The Last of Us. The concept of adhering to or departing from the game, was that something that you discussed and was that a constant thread throughout the season or just something you figured out in the beginning? Ooh, uh, this is fun, actually, because because we were hired so late into the process, I had no time to prepare anything. We were, we were wrapping up Umbrella Academy three, season three as it was, um, and I just sort of made the decision that I, I didn't know much about The Last of Us and I didn't play the game. And so I was like, well... And I remember something that uh, a producer at Bad Robot told me like a decade ago. And he said, don't know too much, because if you know too much, then you're just going to replicate what's already been done. And so I, so I thought about that. I said, you know what? What if I did that? What if I risk not knowing anything and just approach the entire production fresh? Meanwhile, with Emily, 
With me, it was a game that I had played that was my favorite game. So I knew all about the game. I was very excited to join the show and to be able to work on it. And for me, I was approaching it kind of in the middle where I had played the game a couple years before. So I, I wasn't playing it fresh, but I was still in love with it where I knew the characters, I knew the story. And so I brought that with me to the show when Tim and I were starting. And I think... You know, Craig and Neil had such a strong vision and the scripts that Craig had, they were just beautiful from the beginning. And they had such a great idea of what they were going to adapt from the game, what they weren't. And Tim and I were able to follow from those, obviously. But I think what was helpful from knowing the game is I was able to help Tim get little details in there early on. So we would have them in the cuts from the beginning for Neil and Craig and everyone to kind of review. And things like in the episode where... Uh, Ellie and Joel are at Bill and Frank's house and they're going through a bunch of stuff. She finds this the red shirt that's like iconic from the game. And we had tons of footage of her going through all different kinds of stuff, Joel going through all kinds of stuff. And I said to Tim, I was like, that red shirt is super important. So that was in there from very early on. So it just helps to be able to get those little details in there. You know, I hadn't thought of this, but with that background you have, Emily, was there almost sort of an unofficial you being in charge of Easter eggs in that regard? Not necessarily in charge, but definitely trying to get some things in there. Re the the really person in charge of the Easter eggs has to be Craig. I mean, Craig, they, Craig and Neil, really, they just planned it perfectly. You know, it's not like this is some IP that people weren't really aware of and could be turned into something great. It has a rabid fan base from the game, and they're already going to be sort of coming into this loaded for like, all right, you better not disappoint me. This is something I love. Did you get a lot of feedback from the fans of the game? Yeah, I mean, for better or for worse, I believe that it's it was mostly for the better, um, which was great. I think, you know, a lot of fans were disappointed with episode three with Bill because they were like, oh, but Bill was supposed to be this other character and la, la, la. But more than not, the people were really, really, really happy with how it all went to the point where we started seeing these sort of side-by-side -side comparisons with the game and they, you know, little quote comments like, they did it, they made it, they totally nailed it. Uh, meanwhile, we were just like, yeah, we're just uh, doing what we do every day. Um, but I'm really glad that we we were able to do that uh, for the fans um, because they, you know, again, they had a huge stake in, in, in how this was going to be adapted. I, of course, didn't understand what that stake was. So I was happy to sort of, be the person playing for the folks who didn't know the game. And so Emily, Craig, and Neil are the ones who know it. So it was just sort of like this fun sort of collaboration that made it all work for every audience, if, if possible. Well, it certainly did. So the other aspect that I thought was stacked against the show was the timing of its release. And there's a couple of examples. First, the pandemic. Everyone's just gone through the brunt of that. And here's this show touching on this sort of post-apocalyptic world of what happens when this virus takes hold. The other thing was, I don't want to beat on the Z word too much, but The Walking Dead, which does share some superficial similarities to The Last of Us. It had just ended its run, and there was a lot to appreciate about that show, but I think the critical consensus is it kind of staggered over the finish line, possibly leaving the viewing audience with a, a little sort of killer virus undead fatigue. Speaking for myself, I had no familiarity with the game. So I got to be perfectly honest with you. I was not really geared up to watch this show. I heard about it. I was like, oh, I don't know if I'm ready for that. And then it starts rolling out and everyone's like, you got to watch The Last of Us. So I jumped in and of course it was amazing. We already talked about adhering to or departing from the game. Aside from that, were there things like The Walking Dead or The Pandemic? Either of those were brought up as references in any matter in regards to, we want to make sure we don't go too far this way because of those things I talked about, The Pandemic or Walking Dead. That's a good question. And, you know, I think Craig and Neil were, were very aware that coming into the timing of this, they knew the pandemic was, was weighing on everyone's mind. And I think their approach was to lean in a little bit to it because they decided to do the opening scene of, of the pilot is this talk show back in the 1960s where they talk about the possibility of pandemics and, and that pandemics will happen. and so there was this sort of odd sort of, oh, they have, but they're, st they're talking about it in the past. Meanwhile, he's saying that the pandemic that you just experienced is nothing compared to what could happen. So I think they kind of used it in a, in, in a way to ground your understanding of how, how a pandemic would happen and then escalate 
the stakes by saying, if you think this, this was bad, what we just went through, there's something else out there that will absolutely destroy us all. And from that springboard, and what was funny about that scene is I thought it was a really great scene. And I was like, this is a cool scene. And I had no idea that uh, the, the sort of the audience was like, this was the scariest scene in the whole thing. So this was scarier than anything else. No zombies, no nothing. Just the understanding that we could all just die tomorrow from from fungus, from a mushroom. Um, and that was fascinating to me to to sort of uh, listen to everyone uh, feel that way. And I, I feel like that's where they, they utilized uh, the pandemic to uh, sort of their advantage in a way. And in terms of this, you know, the zombie element of it, what I think Craig and Neil do so well is that they build relationships. They build a, a families and characters of families, and they focus on them. They focus on the stories between the characters and less on sort of the perspective of zombie, perspective of, of anything else. Everything is grounded in the relationships. And I think that's how people really connect with these characters and and you know a lot of people were, were disappointed in the first scene because there weren't enough zombies sometimes or, or infected as they would call them but i think what made it interesting was how the the, the world affected the characters and, and how the relationship between joel and ellie developed over time and yes there were some great you know moments where we had uh, infected sequences and action sequences and whatnot uh, but overall it was the connection that was created between the characters that really is um, sort of, uh, that was the North Star for all of us. Yeah, I agree. That was definitely the North Star. I think we're always character building, always story. We're very like story first. So I think that's something that unites us and Craig and like our editorial approaches. Tim and I are very story based, character based. And when we're building our architecture for a scene, that is always the first thing that we're thinking about. So that's something that I think makes a huge difference for this approach. It's not just zombies. It's and, and they're very far down in this story we're telling. We're, we're talking about these people who, at the end of the day, start to feel very real to us. And I remember when we were working on the show, it was just I would go home and I would carry the characters with me and the story with me. And it, it just it was something that was really important to us to portray as we were working, because this the story and the characters really does mean a lot to us. Tim, you mentioned you went up to Calgary to talk to them. The show was shot up in Calgary. Tell me about where you both were working and how you were able to collaborate effectively with each other and with production. Yeah, Craig wanted uh, editorial at, at, at the beginning to be up in Calgary. So we were in the production office. And so every day, the locations were so different and so unique and so all over Calgary that there was no way to be with the production. Um, I think I went for 30 minutes once and then I just came back because I was like, well, I, it'll take me two hours to get back to the production office from this location. And I have lots of work to do. But it was nice because Craig is, is, is a person who likes to be very close to the people he's working with. He likes to have conversations that are not across internet, put it that way. So he likes to be in person. He likes to really sort of shake out how he's feeling and, and, and work in, a, a, in, in sort of a, a really connected environment. So it was great because what he could do is he could just come back from set one night and say, hey... Can you show me uh, the shots here? I just want to make sure we didn't miss this and that. As when he was directing, he could do that. And then when he was uh, working on director cuts, he could pop in on Saturdays and Sundays when he wasn't covering the set and say, hey, let's uh, let's work on this for a little bit. And it just made the whole experience go that much faster because he was right there and he could make adjustments very quickly. It was very efficient for all of us. But of, of course, as soon as the weather in Calgary became unbearable they said yeah this isn't as worth it as as you think it is so time to go um so we were uh, lucky enough to go home at that i was lucky enough to go home at that point emily unfortunately was in los angeles the same time and they had set you up with your your home system correct emily Yep. I was at home working remote. And, you know, Tim and I had been working remote for a while. So uh, when we were on Umbrella Academy, we were remote. When we were on Resident uh, Season 4 for a bit, we were remote just because of the pandemic. So we were used to this workflow, even though I prefer to be in person. And eventually we did move to in person on this show as well. But yeah, we were remote at first. I was remote at first while Tim was in Calgary. And so I was here. He was there. We would just talk on. We would text all the time about stuff or call and talk to each other. Oh, yeah, it was it was honestly, I have to talk to her. It's like my it, I, the collaboration that the two of us had on this was 
truly like it was a team effort at all times. And I was just like, oh, you, I'm going to show you this this sequence and let me know what you think and what can you do here sound wise that can help us with this. And um, and we would just talk back and forth and she'd send something and I'd look at it and and send her adjustments. And then she would tell me, oh, I don't know if this is exactly working. So we were just constantly talking as much as we yeah. possibly could, because I just feel like you know, if you get stuck in a, a situation where you're just thinking for yourself and, and in, you know, a silent, dark room, you might forget, you know, what the purpose of what you're doing is. So I just love having that sounding board. And Emily's been uh, the most uh, fantastic person to collaborate with, which is, you know, how this all got started. Yeah. And I've loved it, too, especially once we got in person more, because I would I'll just go and sit in Tim's room and. He, we will just work together. He's working on the Avon and I'll sit there, but we'll just discuss. And it's like having conversations and learning and and trying things. And I've learned so much by sitting in his room. And he he started letting me do that way back when we were on The Resident. And there was one episode of The Resident where he had this giant surgery scene. And I, I went to him and I was like, I'm just really curious how you're going to cut the scene. He's like, you can sit and watch me cut it. And so I sat in his room for hours and he just walked me through it. And, and I have learned some of the most wonderful things from him just doing that and watching him work and he loves to teach and I've just enjoyed getting to absorb everything I can from him when I have the time to do it. What a good guy you are, Tim. I'm doing my best. I have to live up to the name, right? <laughs> I should have seen that coming. <laughs> Emily, when you are functioning more as an assistant rather than a co-editor, how does that remote workflow impact you? Are there additional things that are now part of your duties? Does it negatively impact some of the things that you're used to doing? What, what's it like for you as an assistant when you are remote? That's a good question. I think overall... The remote workflow as an assistant works pretty well, especially when you know your editor, right? So I already had been working with Tim for a couple of years at that point. So I knew what he was expecting. We already, were, you know, we have that kind of like shorthand texting back and forth. Like we're So for me, it was pretty easy to work remote for Tim. I think my, my biggest negative for the remote workflow is the being kind of isolated. Like you're isolated. You don't get to go. And like, I, I miss so much being able to go to Tim's room and like hang out. So like when I finish my, my work for the day, like prepping dailies or whatever, then I, it's like, I, I normally I would go and like hang out with Tim. And so I would just find myself being like, Oh, this is when I would be there, like watching him edit the scene. And instead I'm waiting and I know he's going to finish it and send it to me. And then we'll talk about it, but I don't get to watch him do it. And so for me, honestly, that was the biggest negative of remote as I just missed working in person with Tim. Can you give me an idea of the um, basic production to post-production workflow for the show? How is it shot? Are you working on more than one episode at a time? Just give me a day in the life of an episode or days in the life. And figure out what I'm trying to say and give me a great answer. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, the, the great answer is that we were always behind and that was wild. We started on episode three and for reasons that are mysterious, my approach and Emily's talent and everything that we were doing with that just dovetailed in exactly with what Craig was looking for. So Craig was like, you know, I really want you to do as many of these as you can. And I was like, okay. And that was tricky because A, it's a lot of work. And the production was basically, I believe, 20 day shoots for every episode. And that's a very long schedule. Uh, but that's because they wanted to do it uh, right. They didn't want to like sort of skimp on things and run out of time and whatnot. So they wanted to do it right. Um, and so a day in the life for us was initially just sort of juggling several episodes that we had been asked to edit as they were going along. And at times it was tricky because I was realizing that I can't do them all. There's just no way in what I do in the process that I use where, and it's Emily and I have a very similar process, where we have to watch everything. We have to, to, to build the nuance of the characters. We cannot just start cutting uh, without having a good basis for, for making decisions. So, you know, and this is sort of how Emily becomes um, a co-editor with me, which is I told Craig at one point when I realized that, you know, the work I was doing was really good. He was really happy with it. And I said, you know, if you want me to do this next episode, uh, which is episode seven, and it was, uh, everything was kind of filmed sometimes out of order based on weather concerns more than anything it's like well we have to stay inside in january so let's film the the indoor episode which is seven early i said to craig i said this is a perfect opportunity for emily to step up here and wouldn't it be great if she could co-edit this with me a because i am got too much going on uh, and b because as a lesbian woman 
and this is an episode with a, a lesbian love story, she will have a really, really deep understanding of this, this relationship, these characters. And I would love to uh, help us make sure that we're doing justice to this relationship, to these characters. And Craig is a real, just a, a massive supporter of people. He's like, I don't care. I, I want good people to be doing things. I don't, yeah, sure. You haven't done that much editing in your career yet, but I really trust you. And I just said, please uh, uh, trust her. And he did. And it was fantastic because we split up the episode. Uh, Emily got to do some of the biggest relationship scenes between the two characters that were the most important. There was never a time where, of course, we still had our, our process where we would talk things out. But now it was like, each of us were showing each other scenes as opposed to me showing her scenes. So then she was showing me scenes and I would give her a feedback based on that. And it was a great experience because uh, in the end, uh, it's all her work up there on, on the screen. There was never a moment where I had to go in and, and take over anything like that. There's none of that um, because I feel like uh, the work that she was doing was fantastic. And Craig was making notes with her and making sure that everything was to his specifications and he was happy with it. So ultimately what happened is we became a team um, and then Craig just would, we would have episodes that were sort of sitting around for sometimes months. And he says, all right, you're going to go do episode six now. Uh, we're like, okay. Um, I said, 20 days. Yeah. Can we do it in 12? Can Emily do it with me? Yeah. Then, then we can do it in 12. And so next thing you know, we're just sort of working uh, very quickly to, to get it uh, all done and, and, it's difficult because I just feel like, you know, there was a lot of trust given to us. There was a lot of responsibility put on our plate. And I'm really grateful that uh, Emily was there because ultimately the two of us having the working relationship that we had, we were able to get through, you know, seven of the nine, um, which was a, a, a feat. Yeah. And, you know, I feel very lucky that Craig allowed me the opportunity to do this and that Tim was pushing for me to do it, too. And it took a lot of people giving me that chance to be able to move up. And the other thing is this kind of connects to what I was talking about earlier. But I was working on sound design from the very beginning when we started on the show. And, and that was how I started working with Craig from the beginning, because Craig loves sound design. And so do I. And so I was on all the on the first episode Tim and I did, which was episode three, doing sound design for that. Then we moved on to the pilot. I worked really hard on the sound design with that, working closely with Craig. And so I think that helped me get in line with him to where, you know, he was more open to me maybe moving up. But at the same time, I was also cutting a few scenes here and there for Tim that Craig also was aware of. So, you know, just as an assistant, taking the opportunity to really work a little extra to to put forth like what I can do for Craig to be able to see, you know, oh, she can do these scenes. Oh, she can do sound design. Um, and then, you know, I'm lucky enough to have Tim, you know, supporting me as well. So all those things kind of mixed together and allowed me to move up, which was fantastic. You're starting work on episode three, but you also have to do, I mean, I would consider it the pilot episode. And that's the one that's just so critical that you get right to build that forward momentum. And Tim, you said it yourself, it starts off with a talk show in the 60s. And then all of a sudden you jump to 2003 and we meet Joel and his family at the time and the whole world falls apart and you have this humongous set piece and they jump another 20 years. And now we're into the post-apocalyptic world and you're having to do the, how did Joel and Ellie meet? Humongous amount of work. And that's not the first thing that you're working on. It's a real, that's, I mean, again, this was a, a wild 18 months, I always call it. It was a very, uh, it, was a, it was a crazy time. It was a lot of fun, but it was also like, whoa, um, here's the thing that we have. We have Craig and he, his scripts are stunning. Um, and so we have those as our, our blueprints, as our basis. We also understand after episode three that he's more interested in the relationships of the characters than he is necessarily in this, not necessarily the spectacle per se, but in sort of the, you know, the, 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 well, I guess it would be the spectacle of it. Um, he feels like the spectacle of it is experiencing it through the characters and grounding the, uh, all of that experience with the characters. So going back and, and, you know, there was a bunch of uh, material that was filmed later for the pilot um, that we were able to integrate. Um, the first two episodes were actually integrated together and became the pilot because HBO having watched the first version of the pilot that ends without meeting Ellie, 
they were wise to say, you know what, we kind of have to meet her as well. Um, and they and Craig was like, you were right. We have a plan. And so we integrated everything together. But approaching it after episode three did help because it made sense to then focus entirely on the character building. And so the, the world was built through the characters. And I was very specific with uh, the character of Sarah because I knew that if the audience loves this girl, that when she dies in the 37 minute mark, you are going to be crushed. Um, and the gamers know it's coming. So I don't have to worry about them. They know it's coming, but the rest of the audience doesn't know it's coming. So I paid very specific attention to playing every scene from her specific perspective. I was always leaning on uh, her experiences and specifically, if even if, the, if, if Pedro, who plays Joel is in the scene, there are less close-ups on Joel than there are on Sarah because I want the scene to be from her perspective so that as an audience, what you're feeling uh, in, you know, in my hope is that this is the person we're going to experience the entire series through. We're going to really bond with her and we're going to be connected to her. And then yes, Pedro is, he's there and he's a star and all that. And once she dies, you understand hopefully that everything was creating the character of Joel through Sarah. And that was the, the goal for the first 40 minutes was to really just lean so heavily into her experience that you, 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 you hurt as much as Joel does when you, when this happens. Um, and then going forward 20 years, it's all about Joel and it's all about the, the loss he's experienced. And hopefully because Sarah has become this person that you loved so much, you see the depths of his despair by basically being able to toss a child, you know, who's died into a fire with no, no emotion, uh, zero. And, and it tells you exactly where he is. And, you know, Pedro Pascal, his performance to me is just absolutely uh, a wonder of restraint uh, because he really didn't want to over, uh, he, he wanted to stay deeply hidden. And so I always said, I have to watch dailies, like this, I'm always like leaning into the screen. And he, and so I would watch the daily so close because these little micro muscles in his eyes, I was seeing so much of the little tiny things behind that he was doing. And the great part of introducing Ellie then is that she's the opposite. She is rambunctious. You know, she really desperately does not like him. He desperately does not want to be near her. You know, he's like, no, 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 no. You, and, and I'm sure it reminds him too much of his daughter. And so basically creating that dynamic where they really don't like each other uh, was why I think the pilot works. And in the end, you want to see the journey that they're about to take uh, and connect with the fact that we feel like there is something happening between these two. Um, and ultimately, that's how everything was built, was the characters. I think everything you said is totally on point with that. I think also with the pilot, what was cool about it is during that time, we were really getting to know what Craig liked. And so that was an episode where there was so much going on. There was so much emotion, so much with story. And I think that was a great starting off point before then we, we you know, went into all these other episodes for us to really get to know Craig, understand what he's looking for for sound. There was lots of sound stuff I was doing with him in that episode that was very helpful to get an idea of what he's interested in for making this world work. Can you give me an example of some of that sound stuff that you would be working on with Craig to make the world work? Yeah, sure. So there's a scene where Joel and Tommy and Sarah are driving and then the plane crashes. And then they wake up in this car, the, the truck that has, you know, been crashed and they're in this town. And original, the original version of the sound, when they woke up, there was lots of noise. That was just in the temp. We'd put in lots of noise because there was it was chaos and you're, you're thinking fear and loud stuff. And Craig came in and watched and he said, no, it should be quiet because the plane has crashed. There's not a lot of people around anymore. And it will be much scarier to be quiet and to feel this environment. you re and So you really feel when there's a gunshot in the distance or you feel like an infected in the distance. And so when we changed that to be quiet with just little sounds here and there, little layers, it, it, it just, it gave that world so much more. And so I think that was, for me was the turning point where I realized 
what Craig was looking for, for things to just be more, more realistic, sometimes a little bit more held back. So then when you're in areas where it's louder or something really big is happening, it's hitting you more because you've before been in these little environments that are just really low on the sound, sound floor. So that was really interesting to experience for sure. Well, I don't think I'm going to be able to resist talking about episode seven anymore. So, um, <laughs> and three and seven actually, because those two are very unique and very important to the series. But in episode seven, it uh, takes place in an abandoned mall, which are a no short supply these days. You probably didn't have any trouble finding one. We didn't. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That episode gives us a really important part of Ellie's backstory and her relationship with Riley. Riley takes Ellie to this mall so they can try and forget the world outside and just enjoy running around, exploring, playing video games, and and maybe building a relationship together, and presumably doing this alone. But while they're in the mall, you have this moment where the camera leaves them and shows that there is one of the infected there, and you see it wake up. And so from that point on, the suspense clock is ticking, and the audience, at least me anyway, is is completely tense, waiting for the inevitable to happen. So during that time as a viewer, your senses are a little heightened. You know, you're scanning the negative space of the frame. You're listening for sounds that will give you some clues. You're responding to the cuts in a different way. So that is another sequence that I would love to know more about in terms of how you crafted it and how you manipulated, because I think manipulate is definitely the key word here, manipulated the audience for maximum effect in that scene. Yeah. I mean, Emily, I think I I, I can answer this a little bit. You'll probably be able to do better. Um, but I found that the most effective way of doing it was to not change the style of the scene anymore. I truly said, I know everyone is going to feel scared at this point because they're going to go, oh my God, this is this, the next scene is where they're going to get uh, in trouble with this. So I tried not to edit with any understanding of that. So I wanted the scenes to feel very normal in comparison, like as, as, as I would normally cut them as though that didn't even exist. So there would, so it basically created, and I think Craig had said this, there's the, the world of Riley and Ellie is this bubble where none of this exists, uh, where no fear and no threats exist. Um, and so I think from our perspective, it was about keeping those scenes as normal as possible, because I think the audience would already have uh, those instincts themselves. And if anything I did to uh, manipulate maybe in a bad way, then I'd be sort of tipping my hand a little bit. So I said, well, the manipulation's already in play. So there's nothing we need to do here. So I know this is an odd answer, but I believe that the answer is that we didn't do anything. Our characters have no idea this is happening. So, so we're not changing anything because Ellie and Riley don't know that's happening. So when we're with them again, they're just focused on each other and like, oh, does she like me like I like her? And that's more what we're focusing on when we go back to them versus the infected that's looming around the corner that we know about as an audience, but our characters have no idea. Building on that, what we know as an audience, I want to go back a little bit to an answer you both gave about perspective. And maybe this is something that you can add some light to from the game, Emily. Because when you were playing a game, you are specifically from somebody's perspective. So in this show, there are times that it feels like the audience is completely aligned with Joel because we know things that Ellie doesn't know. And then it's, it's almost like we're with Ellie because along with her, we're discovering things about this world. So was there any sort of discussion amongst each other or with Craig about from whose perspective in the grand scheme of things is this show? Who is the audience aligned with Joel or Ellie or does it just change? Hmm, that's a good question. I think that it it does change throughout the the episodes. It depends on the scene. I feel like it, it, sometimes it was scene dependent, and normally we would go to Craig sometimes and be like, "Who who should we be sticking with with you know this scene?" Tim, do you have any examples that you can think of? Yeah, you know, I, it's it's a tough one, but I do feel like it's a dual point of view. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like to understand one is to understand the other, and in the same way that in episode three. Bill and Frank was a dual point of view episode. Every like, I would shift point of views mid scene with them um, because I was like, if if I don't follow the, the two of them, if it's only from one character's perspective, the the you know their relationship doesn't work over time because it's only from one character's perspective. And similarly with Ellie and Joel, you know, I can give you a, a specific sequence which was in the last episode where Joel admits to Ellie that he was the one who tried to, to kill himself. And they sit and, and he basically explains to her why, um, you know, uh, he did what he did. 
And it wasn't about, and it was in his perspective, but it was also about her listening and listening to this person who has never told, has, who, who specifically said in episode three, do not tell, let's not tell anybody our stories. We don't do that. You know, we're going to keep everything to ourselves. And then here he is at the end opening up. And if I didn't see her listening and recognizing that, then this, that arc wouldn't land. So I need to basically pay attention to both her listening and him making decisions on what on on, on sharing this information uh, with her, and that was the uh, the way that Craig saw it as well. He says this is about the two of them, you know, this is really about uh, both of them and how each of them are growing closer to each other uh, towards the end, because in you know ultimately it's about the choice that Joel has to make about about Ellie, and so basically starting from you know episode two or three, and then just basically over time, uh, just collapsing their perspectives in, in, in closer and closer together. I think that's what makes the choice at the end of the season so much, uh, so much more impactful. So for episodes three and seven, which we're just going to keep going back to because they really, you know, when people talk about the show, you can't talk about the show without just talking about how impactful those two episodes were specifically. Hearing you talk about how ultimately the the first episode w was truncated from two other episodes and that there was some movement that was possible. Those two episodes, three and seven, really stand on their own. There's some connective tissue between episodes, but you could actually move those around a little bit if you wanted to. Were those always set to be where they were? Where Was there some discussion about these episodes are almost act breaks in a way throughout the season? Can, we could move these a little bit. They could not, actually. And here's the weird thing. And I feel like... Um, Craig and Neil, uh, in their wisdom, understood that both of these side stories served a purpose to the main story. And so for Bill and Frank, their story was a way of showing their life so that it could inform Joel as to who Joel is. So the most important scene in that episode for the main story is when Ellie reads the letter to Joel, where Bill says, you and I are the same. We just protect people. That's what we do. And I did it, and I'm really happy and I hope, you know, you know, do all this and you can protect Tess, who's now already dead. And, you know, and Sarah's now dead. And it's basically informing Joel of who he is. Um, and so that basically tells Joel, this is, the, this is what you have to do. And similarly, in Seven, you know, Riley telling Ellie at the end, you know, you do not give up on your family. It was important to be framed within the context of Joel dying and, and 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 Joel telling her get out don't 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 you dare save me you need to, you need to go um, and so experiencing that entire uh, sort of flashback as it were the episode is really the point of it is to get to that place where Riley says you never give up on your family never and that's the moment where Ellie comes back into the world and says that's what I, and and that's what she learns. And so the two of them are, have an understanding from these characters that put them on an, a new plateau. And so I think, in a, in a way, that's what those side stories are there for. They're these wonderful little tales that inform the, the, the characters' uh, intentions and uh, uh, sort of their, their arcs going forward. So the other thing about these episodes, the way you did them, and this is why I asked you, like, couldn't you move these? Because as you said, they inform who Joel and Ellie are. And it's a much more satisfying, to me, way of doing this as a viewer, that you have these beautiful standalone episodes, as opposed to throughout the rest of the season, you two having to work in all those little details here and there to try and build those characters. So I guess the question for you is, did you find that in the other episodes, you were able to let go of some of that stuff and just... and and be a little more free in how you handle them because you didn't have to worry about like, well, why would Joel make that decision? Or how do we make sure that the audience understands this about Ellie? Ooh, hmm. that's a good question. Wow, that's a toughie. I mean, kind of everything that uh, I, I, most episodes were based on creating the characters of Joel and, and th as Ellie sees them. I can give you an example. In the beginning of the sixth episode, we have the sequence with the native couple. And they're arguing over Joel and Ellie. Joel's got them at gunpoint and says, you know, you got to tell me where we're going and et cetera, et cetera. And then the character played uh, by Elaine Miles, she says, oh, you're scared. You know, she tells Joel, like, I, I can see you. You're scared. 
And Ellie sees that Joel is scared, which scares her. And now she's worried about this. And it's because someone else has picked up on the fact that Joel is scared. And I made sure in editing that scene that there was a moment where Elaine Miles' character looks over at Joel and there was a cut of Joel looking scared so that when the line comes out, it doesn't come out of nowhere. It comes out of a moment that she really had. And I think in building these characters and, 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 and doing those things, that's how we, I think we did it as, as, as elegantly as I think we did is because everything had, uh, it wasn't just being said, it was being experienced before it was being said. And if it was being said, other people were, were basically letting our characters know it versus having a, some sort of an omniscient uh, character explain everything. Does that make sense? I think it does. Yeah. I hope these things work. I, you know, you never know. Well, I mean, the proof is in the, uh, in the ratings, as yeah. it were. Emily, knowing your appreciation for sound design and, and also hearing you talk about how that's a key element for somebody starting out in the assistant role, like, hey, if you can really master this aspect of it, that's a place where the editor's really going to rely on you. The look of this world is certainly very important, but I think the sound is what really sells it. Mm -hmm. And you talked about the set piece in the first episode, just the sound of the infected themselves. Tell me about the uh, evolution of that and how you ultimately came to how those poor, unfortunate souls ended up sounding. That's a good one. Um, the sounds of the infected were something that we worked on for a long time. But for Craig, it was super important that the they didn't sound too... They, he wanted them to sound like they do in the game because it's so iconic, specifically the clickers. Um, but so we're working from this great formula that already existed from the games, but also we needed new stuff. So Craig actually did a lot of work with the sound team on that, on our uh, infected noises and clicker noises. And again, a lot of those sounds, they stem from story. What's happening in the scene? You know, we, and we have the one scene where Ellie's down in this basement and there's an infected that's completely crushed by rubble and all this other stuff. So he's crushed. What does he sound like when he's barely able to breathe? You know, so those are things that we're talking about. It, it's always like kind of a scene basis. How is the story affecting how they sound? Things like that. Yeah. And, and, and if I remember in that specific scene, you know, Craig said, I don't want the, the, the infected character to sound scary. I want yeah. the infected character to sound sad. I want the audience to understand that these were people and they're, they're now trapped. And so it's not about them being necessarily scary, but, you know, uh, relatable, uh, which is an odd thing. And, and for then, you know, out the character of Ellie to go up to this sad character and study the character and then just kill the character uh, in cold, you know, basically in coldly, um, which we find out later uh, in episode seven, why she would do that, of course. Um, and, and, and Craig also made sure with uh, our sound supervisor, Michael Benevente, he would, uh, he would have the original, uh, actors who were the sounds of the clickers from the game. He would invite them to come in and recreate these sounds and they would all go together and they would all work together and they would, they would talk about what each sound was and they would, they would replicate it, um, the way that they were looking for it, but he would use all the original people because he really wanted an authenticity to it. And he wanted to make sure that it was exactly correct. And I remember in that second episode, they went through many, 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 many versions of the clicker sequence until they were exactly happy with it. So as we close things out, I thought a good way to close it would be to talk about advice for up and comers from the perspective of where you each are in your careers. So Emily, for you, advice to people looking to be assistant editors and moving up to editing and Tim, for you, people wanting to move from assistant to editorial. My biggest advice is just to, I know that the struggle can be real, being an assistant and sometimes even getting the job as an assistant. Then the struggle is to move up. But I think the most important thing is to every day go into work with a great attitude and be asking your editor questions, trying to absorb as much as you can from them, trying to understand like, what, what does this person do that's successful? And how can I adapt myself to sort of you know, I can still have my own approach as an editor, but also like I want to kind of pull in things that, you know, Tim is doing or I want to pull in things that my editor Nicole's doing. Like, I think it's important to learn from people that are working as editors and to not just assume that we already know everything. Like I, I am always trying to go into work and to learn something that day. Yeah. And as an editor, you know, again, I was I was 
mentored, and it meant so much to me that it became part of my career. Um, and every assistant I've ever had has become an editor in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and I'm very proud of that. Uh, and a lot of it is because Norman Buckley said to me, sit in the room with me and watch me do what I'm doing. And that's one of the reasons why, as Emily was saying earlier, that I allow people to come into the room because I don't want to hide the craft. I don't want to hide what I'm doing. I want them to see it. Uh, A, because I think it's important for the craft to flourish. Um, the craft, it can be tricky at times because everyone has an editing system, but not everyone is a really good editor. Um, and so it's nice to be able to say, here's a reason why we're making these decisions and we're using these great tools uh, to be able to make these decisions, but everyone can get the tools now. It didn't used to be that way, but now it is. Um, but in order to tell a really strong story, you have to have a great sense of, of craft and why you're doing what you're doing from both a psychological, architectural, and emotional reason. Um, and you have to also be able to get along with people. Um, and that's like the key. And I'm in, in the same way, I look for assistant editors who are like Emily, who are looking to learn, who are eager, who want to, uh, who don't just say, oh, I'm going to leave now. My, my shift is over. You know, they go, hey, is there anything else? I mean, I'd love to see what you're doing. You know, I, I, I'm, I love seeing uh, sort of the hustle of, of an assistant who wants to know more. Um, so that's what I'm generally looking for. And I'm, I'm eager to, to help assistant editors um, have an understanding of that. And so I, I, I listen as much as I can to assistants and I, and I support them and I try and help them because in the end, I was helped. And if I wasn't helped, I would not nearly be where I am right now. And so that's why I, it's so important to me to make sure that I mentor. And hopefully the, the, my, the people who I mentor will mentor again, just like I did when Norman uh, mentored for me. Well, Tim, when it comes to mentoring, you definitely walk the talk. So kudos to you. Um, kudos to both of you for just an amazing series of television that, again, that I went into it like, mm, I don't know if I feel like watching this and went out of it desperately waiting for season two. So get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, last thing, you know, Emily schooled you on the uh, on the game, The Last of Us. Did you get a chance to tell her a thing or two about Mortal Kombat? Oh, <laughs> well, only because I'm so old would I understand what Mortal Kombat is, so, and especially Mortal Kombat 2. Um, I, I didn't really school her on anything. She, you know, she knows more than I do anyway. So, um, but you know, it was very fun to do Mortal Kombat 2 and to have the sounds of Mortal Kombat 2 because it took me right back to my uh, summers in Michigan playing that arcade game and losing all my quarters. So it was an absolute uh, joy to be able to re-experience that. Thanks for repping us geezers, Tim. You love it. <laughs> oh, who are we kidding? I was already in college even when Mortal Kombat came out. I'm strictly Space Invaders material. Look it up, kids. You need further proof that I'm over the hill? Well, you probably don't. You heard Tim mention being mentored by Norman Buckley? I recalled interviewing Norman Buckley years ago. Well, I went and found that interview. It was back in 2009 for the show Gossip Girl. You know who else was in that interview? Timothy Good. Here, just listen. I think where we want to start is the life cycle of a single episode of a show like Gossip Girl. We basically have two days after dailies. This is Tim Good. Uh, we have two days after dailies to uh, provide uh, the director the editor's cut, and then we have four days working with the director to do the director's cut. It is no shade on Tim that I forgot he and editor Harry Jirgen were in that interview, too. It's just a byproduct of me doing this for way too long. Thanks to both Tim and Emily for checking in with us today. Such a cool show, and it was loads of fun to get the insider perspective from the cutting rooms. Hey, are you a student? Yes, you are. We all are. You never stop learning. You might stop remembering, but not learning. And if you are a student at a college or university, doesn't matter if they have a film or media studies program or not, that school can join the Media Composer for Students program, which allows them to give their students Media Composer for free. What a bargain. I will put a link in the show notes so you can learn all about it. Nothing was free when I went to college. Well, that'll do it. Another one in the books. Hope you liked it. Next week, another big TV show that just wrapped up its latest season. Which one? Well, come back and find out. Until then, this is Mad Fury thanking you for joining me right here on The Rough Cut. <laughs>